Welcome to the Veritas Forum, engaging university students and faculty in discussions about life's hardest questions and the relevance of Jesus Christ to all of life. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the warmth of your welcome to the University of California in Santa Barbara. It's the first time I've been here and as you just heard, I am a mathematician. You may not know the correct definition of a mathematician, so I better give it to you. It's a person who talks in other people's sleep. <laughs> <laughs> and I mention that because at the moment in my body clock it is a quarter past four in the morning. And so I hope that it's not going to be me that goes to sleep while I talk. But my qualifications as a mathematician have very little to do with our topic this evening. I address you as a human being to fellow human beings. And you've asked me the hardest problem that I face and the hardest problem you face. And I'm sure this evening as you think of the tragedy that occurred at this campus around a year ago, it's a very poignant memory for many of you. You come very close to acts that violate all our con concepts of fairness and decency and proper behavior. And we all face things like that. So I'm going to try and say a few things by way of introduction. And then we have a noble philosopher here from your university who is going to put the screws on me intellectually and is going to question me. And that will probably be far more interesting than anything I say. But just to get the ball rolling for a, a moment, there are two sides to the question. It's one thing to be a professor of oncology and study cancer and help treat it. It's another thing to be told you've got three months to live because you've got cancer. So there's the perspective of the observer that sees the suffering and the pain. And there's the perspective of the person that's actually experiencing the suffering and the pain. And it's important to differentiate, therefore, between intellectual comments and thinking about it, as we all must, but also the matter of sympathy, the heart, and counseling. And we need both. There's a intellectual side and there is a very deep pastoral side. I'm very aware of both of those because I happen to be in my college at Oxford not only professor of mathematics but the pastoral advisor. And once you start asking the questions they flow in an unending stream. You can mend a broken leg, you can't mend a lost friend or a lost child. And you ask, why did that happen to them? Why did they get killed and I was spared? And so on. And the questions flow and we need to distinguish now two more things. The sources of pain and suffering are two. We tend to distinguish the problem of natural evil or the problem of pain from the problem of moral evil. Natural evil is the thing, the kind of thing that nature does to us. Tsunamis, cancers, heart attacks, brain tumors, earthquakes. Moral evil is the evil that bad people do to both good and bad people. Now, of course, uh, they can be linked because human greed can deforestate uh, a portion of the Earth's surface and that results in starvation for the next generation. And so you get a, a catastrophe, a natural catastrophe resultant on moral evil. And as potent symbols of the two, you might think of two cathedrals. One is the Coventry Cathedral in England and the other is Christ Church Cathedral in New Zealand. And if you go into these two cathedrals as I have done, you will see two things you will see that something terrible has happened to these buildings. In the case of Coventry Cathedral, it was a bomb. 
in the case of Christ Church Cathedral, it was an earthquake. But you see traces of beauty in both of them. You can see what they have been. And so what you're presented with is a mixed picture. Traces of beauty, evidence of catastrophe and evil. And that is our problem, ladies and gentlemen, because the world itself faces us with a very mixed picture. I call it beauty and barbed wire. And for some of you sitting here tonight, you're much more aware of the beauty, the surf, the beautiful surroundings here in Santa Barbara, but others are really hurting. You've been disappointed or a parent has taken suddenly terminally ill or you yourself have got a disease that you're very concerned about. An earthquake has shattered your hopes. So we need to face those two things. And you immediately see that simplistic answers are out of the question. I don't even like to talk of answers. I like to talk about ways in to be, being able as human beings to cope with the things that arise. So we're going to think a little bit about this and I'm going to just throw in something from the more intellectual side at the beginning and we'll move on to the questions, the existential problems later. But let me say, I have very deep sympathy with people who become atheists because of this question. I have many colleagues around the world and they are impressed, particularly if they're scientists, by the evidence of God in the laws of nature, in the very fact that we can do science and so on. But if you begin to talk to them about a personal God, they say, forget it. There may be some vast intelligence out there, but does he care? Clearly not, because this world is in such a mess. I've stood in Auschwitz many times during the Cold War, the depth of winter, which was the way Auschwitz was designed to be the massive killer that it became. I've wept every time as I thought of the hor horrendous events of the Holocaust. How do you face that kind of thing? And I repeat, I recall just at this moment speaking to two Israeli people and when they discovered I believed in God, they said, well, I'm sorry, but we don't. And in the end, I persuaded them because they didn't want to tell me why. They said, look, we, we read books and we were reading a book by the Israeli Nobel Prize winner for literature, Bashevitz Singer, who wrote a book called The Slave. And uh, the husband said to me, he said, you know, we like reading out loud. And I was reading out loud one evening to my wife. And suddenly we turned the page and there was a horrific description about a Russian pogrom in which Jewish women and children had been buried alive. And he just said to me, look, he said, the light went out. The light went out. And we haven't believed in God since. Now, these are very real things, ladies and gentlemen. And I hope you feel them, because we've got to feel them. This is the number one reason I get for people turning atheists. You've asked me to do this topic. I would say probably 60% of the Veritas forums in recent times, people have asked for this topic. Because it's such a real one. Because our world is throwing up examples of violence that we thought had been left behind in the Middle Ages. And we're seeing the most horrendous things happening, tragically, often in the name of God. And it, it, it really focuses our minds on um, how we respond to it. Now, the response of atheism is very understandable to my mind. But at an intellectual level, not so. And let me explain that just for a few minutes. You see, if there is no God, it's worth asking the question, where do the concepts of good and evil come from? Now, this is a long history. And if you read Russian literature, and I hope you do, you'll have come across Fyodor Dostoevsky. And you may remember that once he wrote, Yesli Boga Nyetto Ivsyok Pozvolyum, 
which means, I think I ought to translate that for some of you, didn't I? Uh, which means if God does not exist, everything is permissible. Now, let's be clear, Dostoevsky did not mean that atheists cannot behave morally. Of course they can. In fact, I would go as far as to say that my atheist friends could put me to shame morally. And the reason, from my Christian perspective, is very simple. I believe that all men and women, whether they believe in God or not, no matter what they believe, are actually of infinite value as moral beings they've been created in the image of God. And so, therefore, they are capable of both recognizing good and doing good. So that's what, not what Dostoevsky was saying. He wasn't presenting a slander on all atheists, saying you're all immoral. Not at all. What he was saying is at the deeper rational level, if you follow the atheist path to its logical conclusion, you end up in a world without morality. Now let me give you a contemporary example of that. Richard Dawkins, uh, whom you may know that I have uh, had one or two little discussions with in public. Um, <laughs> Richard Dawkins once wrote a very open and honest, logical conclusion to his atheistic train of thinking. It goes like this. In a universe of blind physical forces and genetic replication, some people are going to get hurt, other people are going to get lucky, and you won't find any rhyme or reason in it, nor any justice. The universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect. If there is at bottom no design, no purpose, now wait for it, no evil and no good. Nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. DNA neither knows nor cares. DNA just is. And we dance to its music. Of course, he's following Nietzsche, who was a consistent atheist who pointed out that it's ludicrous to expect to retain Christian values and get rid of God because the destruction of God is the destruction of all moral value. And that's exactly what Dawkins says. But see what that means. It means that the people that flew the jet planes into the Twin Towers were simply dancing to the music of their DNA. Well, that means that who can blame them for dancing to the tune of their DNA? This is hard determinism. Now, I know that Richard Dawkins tries to rescue himself from that, saying, we can rebel against our selfish genes, but as several atheist philosophers have pointed out, not so fast. You've just been telling us that we are totally the expression of selfish genes. So where do you get this non-material principle from that enables us to rebel against them? And I've put him up against this a couple of times, and he's never attracted it. What am I suggesting to you, ladies and gentlemen, is this, and it's a very interesting situation, because it means that if you reject God, you're removing from yourself the grounds on which you even formulate a problem of evil. And yet, if you bring God in, you create the problem of evil. So, it's difficult both ways, isn't it? And that, of course, means that you need to face questions like this. If there is no transcendence, no God, then how can there be any objective standard of good? And Charles Taylor, who wrote a fascinating book, This Secular Age, agrees with this. He says, the modern age, more or less repudiating the idea of a divine lawgiver, has nevertheless tried to retain the ideas of moral right and wrong, not noticing that, in casting God aside, they have also abolished the conditions of meaningfulness for moral right and wrong as well. Thus, even educated persons sometimes declare that such things as war or the violation of certain human rights are morally wrong, and they imagine they have said something true and significant. Educated people do not need to be told. I disagree with this, actually. Educated people do not need to be told, however, that questions such as these have never been answered outside of religion. And the point has been well made that... The irony that the very morality that Richard Dawkins uses to condemn 9-11, which he claims radicalized him, that very morality he uses is actually an essential part of Christianity. 
Thomas Jefferson, interesting person to quote, but Thomas Jefferson recognized the connection when he said, God who gave us life gave us liberty. And can the liberties of a nation be thought secure when we have removed their only firm basis, a conviction in the minds of the people that these liberties are the gift of God? And I'm very interested in some of the leading continental atheist intellectuals and the towering genius among them is probably Jürgen Habermas. Uh, he's an atheist and he says, but be careful, he says, be very careful what you do with religious belief because when it comes to ethics, morality, if you look at our Western tradition of human rights and all this kind of thing, where did they come from? He says the Judeo-Christian tradition. To this day, and I'm quoting him now, we have no other source. And then he makes a very interesting statement. He says everything else is idle postmodern chatter. So, where have we got so far? Not very far, I confess. But where we've got to, at least, is to summing up, we've got two perspectives. The observer status perspective, where we're thinking about it, but we're not actually suffering. We've got the insider situation where we're actually suffering and perhaps almost incapable of thinking about it. And then we've got the two problems, the problem of pain, of natural evil, and the problem of moral evil. And what I'm suggesting to you just to set the ball rolling for the interviewer here is that the atheist route seems the most attractive and yet it creates the most intellectual problems. So where do we go from there? Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Over to you. Okay. There's a very long tradition of this logical, logical problem of evil in, in philosophy, starting with an ancient philosopher, Epicurus, and um, maybe popularized by uh, David Hume, um, where it seems like they, you know God, God couldn't have certain um, properties. That God, God couldn't be a certain way, um, and uh, also for evil to exist. So, if God is all good, all powerful, all knowing, how can He allow evil, or how can there be evil? Um, so, if He, you know, if He's good, He He would want to stop evil. If He's all knowing. He would know when evil occurs or when it's going to occur. And if he's all-powerful, he'd be able to stop it. So why is there evil? Uh, so I, I'm curious to see how you would respond to this, this line of reasoning, which says that, hey, the existence of God, the existence of evil, it's incompatible. Well, you're right. It's a very old idea. Epicurus and, of course, his main interpreter later, the Latin poet Lucretius, had a huge influence at the time of the Renaissance intellectually in Europe. And this is one of the problems that comes up again and again, and it's a very important question. And David Hume um, made it very popular around the place. And I'm sure as students, I remember in Cambridge, as students going round and round and round and round with this argument, if you've got a good <laughs> God, surely he could, would, might, perhaps, and all this kind of thing. Have you ever found a satisfactory outcome to that argument? Have you? No. I've never met anybody who has. And <laughs> my way into it is to ask a number of questions to myself, if I may do that. Absolutely. The first is this. We start off with, couldn't a good God if he's all-powerful, have made a world in which human beings didn't do these awful things? Well, of course he could. That answer may surprise you. In fact, not only could God have made such a world, you could make such a world, and we have done, that we call it a robotic world. Robots do exactly what they're programmed to do. There's no morality involved at all, but they're not human. Now this is a very important thing because what I've discovered thinking about it is that I find myself 
if I'm not careful, wishing myself out of existence. Now let me try and explain that. From my perspective as a Christian, the biggest gift you've been given as a human being is part of what it means to be made in the image of God. Only humans, according to the Bible, are made in the image of God. The universe shows his glory, but it's not made in his image. You are. Now, what does that mean? Well, the amazing thing is that it means, first of all, that you're a rational person. You're capable of relationship. And to be capable of relationship, there is a sine qua non. There's a basis of something that you must possess, and that is a certain degree of freedom. And the biblical story, which I won't go into tonight, but it's, it is magnificently profound, tells us about that gift that God has given to us as humans. The ability to say yes or no, one's the flip side of the other. And that is what creates the possibility of love. Now, of course, you can remove that, because if you have a universe, it seems to me logically, where love and relationship is possible, hate must be possible by exactly the same definition. And as C.S. Lewis pointed out, if you have God intervening, suppose I use a stick of wood, and this is his example, and I owe a great deal to him. I'm old enough to have heard him actually lecture, but that's another story. Um, <laughs> I could tell you about that sometime. But... Uh, if I use a stick to prop up something or build a house with, that it retains its tension and its strength. But if I start to bash your head with it, that it suddenly becomes flexible like rubber, Lewis points out that that is exactly removing your freedom and your autonomy and demoting you from being human. So as we approach this, it's not an answer to the question, but the point is we're often wishing that God would do things that would leave a universe that's sterile in which humans could not exist. So let me put it another way, even more provocatively. I have three children and seven and a half grandchildren. All right? Now, I remember when the first one was born, I held the little girl in my arms. And I thought, you know, you could grow up to reject me. It's true, isn't it? And many of you may be hurting for that very reason. Rejection either from parents or siblings and so on tonight. It's a very real thing. Why bother having children? What I'm trying to explain to you is God took a risk in making beings like you and me. A very real risk. Because he gave us this wonderful gift which we prize above everything else to be treated as a responsible human being capable of love. Mm -hmm. So what I'm suggesting is that the existence of moral evil at least is not necessarily a contradiction to either the concept of God's power or his goodness. Okay, uh, so they're not, you're saying maybe logically incompatible you have maybe you can't have a world like this without free will or without free choice yes that's right but I, I mean I wonder how important uh, is is the extent of free will that that we've been given um, I'm also I also have children I have three daughters and I let them have a, a sort of autonomy um, that maybe isn't you know put myself in the place of God, that's analogous to the autonomy God gives us, right? Um, I, I let them make their own choices, but if, if I were downstairs um, and I heard one of my daughters screaming, and I went, up, went upstairs and I saw that one of my other daughters was, you know, beating the one who was screaming, or even worse, you know, stabbing her or something, right? Mm -hmm. Am I going to sit back and say, you know what, like I want to respect their autonomy, free will is an important thing. Um, I encourage you to stop stabbing your sister, but I won't force you to, right? No, I would jump in as a father, I would uh, prevent her, I would, I would restrain her, uh, so why doesn't God do the same? Um, what, you know, why does he let, uh, 
you know, little, little children get raped? Um, is, is free will so important that he let the perpetrator make his own decisions in that case? Well, uh, I will come on your side for a moment and add okay. to the fact. I've noticed you've got police in this country. Yes, we do. You've yes. noticed that, have you? Yes. yes. <laughs> well, <laughs> but they can't always be jumping in. And the difficulty with the jumping in, I mean, one is very sympathetic with this approach. And of course, when kids are kids, we do that as parents that if you follow that logically, jumping in will have to occur at any slight even thought of evil, and you end up with your universe with no freedom whatsoever. Lewis deals with that very effectively, I think. I have a great sympathy with this, with the, with the, with the jumping in, but if you follow it, it seems to me that he's got to jump in once the thoughts are beginning. He, wouldn't, he, he would need to interfere in the neurons so that evil thoughts would never be formulated and so on and so forth. And if you follow that, you end up with a deterministic world. Yeah. So I maybe, don't think you get away from it. Yeah, maybe I should reevaluate like my, my parenting strategies here. So. Oh, I'm not sure that you should. I jump okay, in. You keep okay, jumping okay. in. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in. Yeah. Uh, okay. So maybe you know maybe it's not you know incompatible um, God's existence with evil, but but does does it make it unlikely, you know, uh, especially, does it make God's existence unlikely, especially given the amount of evil we see in this world, the types of evil, like I said, um, you know, little children that we, you know, we take to be innocent uh, are having atrocious acts committed against them, or a, a couple of hundred thousand people dying in a tsunami, which seems not to be the result of any person's free mm -hmm. choice. Um, or, you know, uh, thousands of people starving every day um, in various countries. So, so which um, of those it, questions do you want me to look at? Yeah, the, the main <laughs> question is, like, given the amount of evil, the kind of evil we see around us, even if that's not, like, logically incompatible with God's existence, does that make God's existence unlikely? It appears overwhelming. I mean, I take the point fully. Uh, sometimes people start to argue this way and they say, well, a certain amount of pain is good. The mechanism of pain is very important. It's a very good thing that where if I put my hand into a fire, there's a pain mechanism that tells me to take the hand out. And I've noticed that people that play that very curious war game called American football, do you know it? Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I once watched the one uh, in the with one of the people on the roll of honor and he was trying to explain to me a Brit what this game was all about, you see. This is just a little story. Um, and after sure, an hour... Sure, evade my question. Yeah, no, no, I'm coming to your question. After an hour, he said, do you understand the game? Oh, I said, perfectly. I can see that football is a series of prayer meetings interrupted by war. <laughs> but now, <laughs> let me come straight back to your question. People who are in those games, put up with a lot of suffering to train. And you see that. They've put up with enormous endurance. That's okay. The question you're raising is, what about this disproportionate suffering? Well, now let me make the thing even harder, as I do for myself thinking about it. I arrived in Christchurch two days after the earthquake. And I had to meet people that had lost their husbands and their wives just five days before. I had to speak to the largest gathering of people that uh, they'd known in Christchurch for, for very many years. And what do you say? And the irony of the situation was that, quite independent of it, I'd been reading a book on plate tectonics about a month before. And here's the, the problem, uh, which makes things in a way worse, because I'm told by the experts on geology and on the nature of the Earth's crust, that plate tectonics are absolutely essential for human life. So here is a mechanism on which our life depends, which is destroying life. And that raises the very same question, but just with a mm. little twist, as we raised beforehand. Could God not have made a world in which <laughs> you don't need plate tectonics? <laughs> And, of course, the earth wasn't sinning. The earth wasn't doing anything evil. The problem is that people build houses on, on known fault lines, but then they didn't necessarily know that that was a fault line. And 
<coughs> Similarly, fire. Could God have made fire that heated but didn't burn? That wasn't dangerous? This is a very dangerous universe. And if you are, like me, a Christian, you have to believe in that sense because it's, 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 it's part of essential Christianity. God created a world with all these laws and things which make such things happen. And there's large loss of life and all this kind of thing. Now, when I face that, I say, okay, let's become an atheist. Mm -hmm. But then I run straight up against the fact that two things happen. One I've already mentioned. I then am very puzzled as to where my evil concept comes from, my moral conscience comes mm -hmm. from. But secondly, I realize that the atheistic root doesn't remove the suffering. It's still there. I mean, many of my friends will admit that. They say we're atheists, but that hasn't solved the suffering. It won't remove the cancer or the tsunamis uh, uh, and so on and so forth. So it's not as simple as all of that. And I agree with you. I, can, I said at the beginning, because I wanted to say it, and I believe it, that I understand people uh, abandoning God for this reason. But if we have to sit and think about it and say, well, um, if... Atheism means there is no morality. Where did this come from? But if it came from God, then we're back in the circle of the problems we already had. And that seems pretty insoluble. So what I now do is, well, it comes from my training as a mathematician, I suppose. If you keep asking a question for thousands of years and you don't get an answer to it, it might be time to change the question. And I mean that quite seriously, not to avoid questions, but to see if there are any other questions we can ask. Because when you and I have finished our discussion, Keith, we're still left with the beauty and the barbed wire, aren't we? We can still see beauty and experience it, and we can see barbed wire bombs uh, uh, and misery and suffering around the place. So I ask myself another question, and it's this. Is there any evidence anywhere that there exists a God who could be trusted with that? Now, that's a huge question. Can you rephrase that? Yes, well, certainly. Is there any evidence, since we're faced with these two things that are in deep tension, beauty and barbed wire, is there any evidence that there exists a God that you could trust to ultimately resolve that? And my answer to that, cautiously, is yes, there is. Shall I explain that to you? Because sure. uh, sooner or later, we got to get to this central thing. Uh, let me try and make it as brief as possible. And you'll probably see, as I go through, that it's one of the major reasons I'm actually a Christian. You know that at the heart of Christianity there is a series of claims that principally that Jesus made. The first one is that he was God incarnate. Now, you may find that absurd. You may find it something you can't even begin to conceptualize. But as with every other philosophy, and I hope that you'd be digging into all kinds of worldviews, we must listen to what they have to say before we try to evaluate them. So I'm going to do my best to try to explain how at the deeper level Christianity gives a way into this. I'm not say solves it, gives a way into it that we might begin to be able to trust. Okay, that's a modest ambition, but listen to what it says before you judge it. What it says is that Jesus was God incarnate visiting our planet. He ended up on a cross. So, putting it crudely, it raises a deep question, what's God doing on a cross? Well, at the very least, surely, it shows us that God has not remained distant from human suffering, but has himself become part of it. That's point number one. Point number two is, if that was all, I would have nothing to say. 
But you see, the central claim that was preached from the very beginning of Christianity and started Christianity was that Jesus had conquered death and risen from the dead. That death is not the end. Now if death is not the end, these hard problems still remain hard, but they take on a completely different perspective. Because if you look back at historic Christianity, you'll discover something that's not often mentioned these days, but I'm going to mention it, because it's germane. The one bit of major philosophy we get in the New Testament is when Paul the Christian apostle was invited to give a seminar in philosophy in the University of Athens, the philosophical court that we call the Areopagus. And what he did there is very interesting. He showed himself aware of the Epicureans and the Stoics and all the rest of it. But what he did was he said something that they found utterly astonishing that was way outside their comfort zone. He talked about Jesus who had died and rose again and therefore had been appointed to be the righteous judge of the world. That is, he told those philosophers in the first century AD that there was going to be a final judgment. That's magnificent, you know. That now, to my mind, adds a huge element into this whole debate. Because if there is a righteous and good God, then he will be utterly fair in his judgment. Just think for a moment. Do you remember what I said about Richard Dawkins? He says there's no good, no evil, but he said something else. He said there's no justice. Now, a lot of what we've been talking about tonight revolves around our deep-seated concept of justice and fairness. It isn't fair that those children should be killed. It isn't fair that those Jewish people should die in the Holocaust. It isn't fair. It's our concept of justice. Now think, just for a moment, if atheism is true, who's going to get justice? Ever. The vast multi-billions of people who've ever lived don't get justice in this life. We are so fortunate living in our privileged West. And there's no next life to get justice in, so they'll never get it. So on the atheist worldview, evil triumphs. Hitler does what he likes, and then when he's cornered at the end, he blows his brains out, and he gets away with it. Oh no, says Scripture. Oh no, says God. There will be a final assessment. That's why I said this is magnificent. Because it's the thing that backs up what I call my conscience. That my interest in justice is not an illusion. It's been planted there by God. So that if it's going to be realistic and consistent, God himself must ultimately do justice. So what does that mean? Well, it means, of course, ladies and gentlemen, that God's got to sort this mess out one day. Now, to believe that is really the focus of my alternative question. Is there any evidence anywhere that there's a God into whose hands you could trust that? Atheism is zero to say. It is no hope. Because although it claims to have solved the problem at one intellectual level, it doesn't remove the suffering, but by definition it removes all ultimate hope. And Dawkins put it to me when I said this to him. He said, well, I work for justice in this world. I said, so do I, Richard. It's wonderful to get it. But just think, who's going to get it? What proportion of the, uh, the, the, the people in world history? Most of them won't. So here is a huge thing. Now, in order to believe something like that, I would want a huge amount of evidence. And that is why I believe that this is another subject, of course, but it's something that's very dear to my heart, and I've written about it. I would want to be very sure that death wasn't the end of the Jesus rose from the dead, and he was who he claimed to be. Then I could begin to see that he could be trusted with it. When we see his attitude to people who were downtrodden, oppressed, and all this kind of thing, if what he did on earth, in a very limited way to some people, not everybody, 
if that's what he's like and that's what God is like, then maybe I can begin to trust God with it. And maybe the, one of the central statements of Christianity would begin to make sense. God loved the world and he gave his son. That's big stuff. Because it seems to me, and the final point I want to make about it is this. I've seen its effect in hundreds of people's lives. A lady walked out early in Christ Church. She had lost her husband, but she wrote me a note. And I had said something just roughly like I've said to you now. And she said, this is the first glimmer of hope I've had. Let me tell you another thing. I don't know whether you've ever listened to the reading of the names on 9-11, have you? I stood at Ground Zero two years ago, and I listened to most of the reading of the names. It goes on for many hours. Do you know what? There wasn't one speck of a trace of atheism. Have you ever noticed that? There were many assertions of faith in God. And there were some very poignant things of young people saying, Dad, happy birthday. It's your birthday today. And they'd lost their dad. They were, it was so real. I was moved to tears just sitting watching it, just above ground zero in a hotel. And I listened carefully. I didn't hear a single assertion of atheism. Just a little point to make. So, sorry to go on about that, but it's such an important thing. Now remember, I'm not claiming to have the solution. That's some kind of magic. But at the level of people's hearts and lives, I've seen people utterly transformed when they begin to grasp that they could perhaps trust God with this. Thank you. I think I'll ask one final question. Okay. I'll make it a doozy, and then we'll go into the Q&A. Okay. I thought this was a Q&A, but anyway. <laughs> the Q&A from the audience. Oh, right. Yeah, okay. sorry. Um, okay, so you mentioned Christianity. You mentioned the God of the Bible. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that this God is just. How much have you read the Old Testament, where we see God commanding the Israelites to destroy entire nations? And we're not talking about the men of war, right? We're talking about families, um, infants, even animals leave nothing alive. Um, and th so, so this isn't, uh, you know, God's people doing something in God's name. It was a direct command from God. Um, what do you do with that? Um, how, how, do you, how do you respond to that, given the view of God that you put forward as one who will make all things right in the end? The answer to your first question is, yes, I do read the Old Testament. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't doubt it. This is a question that needs to be taken extremely seriously. Because it presents us with something that seems to be so anomalous. Let me demonstrate how anomalous it is. One of the most extensive records of this kind of thing, and let's keep it to the invasion by Joshua of the Canaanites, occurs in the fifth book of the Bible, which is called in English Deuteronomy, which means the second law. Now, here's a very curious thing. The very moral judgment that we use to condemn this is in the book that describes it. That is a very striking feature. Even more so, Deuteronomy is that book of the Old Testament that has, so far as we know, the most ancient rules in history of humanitarian war, if there ever could be such a thing. Jonathan Sachs, our former chief rabbi, who's a brilliant philosopher and always worth reading, points out that here is the, a kind of codex which helps you say, well, don't go to war unless it's absolutely necessary. Spare the women and the children. Spare the animals. Don't burn up the land and all this kind of stuff. And that's in the very book that describes this thing. Mm. Now, that makes it very odd. 
How is it, I ask, that Deuteronomy doesn't appear to be embarrassed by this event? When it appears to contradict all the canons of law that pack the book. You see, if the events had been described in some very obscure book of the Bible in the hope that nobody would notice them, that would be another thing. But here they are in the middle of this. So they themselves raise the question. But it's interesting, therefore, that one must now begin to think. This phrase, to wipe the lot out, is a phrase that in one chapter is repeated, I think, seven or eight times. Nicholas Waltersdorf is one of the world's leading scholars on these things. And at a conference not long ago on the topic, he was pointing out that this phrase occurs so often that we be, need to be very careful of taking it literalistically. What do I mean by that? Well, the whole of England came to the funeral of Princess Diana. What, weren't there some people in bed with flu? Well, of course there were. It means a vast crowd came to it. And we use hyperbole to um, do this kind of thing. Now, I have sat occasionally, very rarely, in rugby matches. And you've probably sat in football matches and people in front of you are saying, massacre them, kill them, wipe the whole lot of them out. What do they mean? Do they mean that literally? Of course not. And what Walter's door points out, the reason that the book is not embarrassed is that whatever this command was, it didn't infringe any of those rules. It meant score a decisive victory. Now, that's very interesting. I, I don't completely know what to make of it. But I point out that it's nevertheless a very interesting thing. You just listen to ordinary people shouting and screaming, and they don't mean do it literally. The next thing is, did it literally happen? And the answer to that is no, historically, because all those cities that were supposed to be, if a literalistic reading is true, wiped completely out, still existed a few chapters later, and they were full of people. <laughs> So, in fact, they weren't completely wiped out. It didn't actually happen. So, one now begins to think that some of the readings of this are a little bit too simplistic. And, of course, it's not, there are a whole lot of objections that come up that one could deal with seriatim, like, you know, Israel were God's blue-eyed favorites and so on. No, it wasn't that at all. This wasn't genocide or anything like it. And God said, if you compromise with their idolatry, exactly the same thing will happen to you. And it did. So that would be my first approach to that, uh, Keith. I'm not saying it's an answer to it. But what I've discovered with scripture is the more seriously you take it and question it as we do any other historical claims, you can begin to approach it to see, well, perhaps it's not as, as absurd as it says, mm. and perhaps it fits perfectly well within the context of one of the highest um, descriptions of the law that you can give. But of course, it raises mm. other questions, as you know, because uh, this idea of war in the name of God is very uh, near to problems today uh, sure. uh, around the world. Yep. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Professor Lennox, we'll now be, uh, I'll, I'll now be reading questions that you have sent in by, by text. Um, I have some of them here on, on cards. Uh, the first one is related, I think, to, to the one you just answered. So it fits nicely. If God is good, how can he send people to hell for eternity? That seems, that seems cruel, especially if people have never heard of God. So well, maybe worse. It certainly yeah. does when you phrase it that way. <laughs> I can I can rephrase first, it if you'd like. Well, no. The first thing is to check: are, are we thinking biblically? The notion of sending people to hell conjures up visions of Dante's Inferno and all this kind of thing. Let me again just make some comments. These are huge topics, and you're about well, you've discovered it already. Uh, one of the things you will find in the Q and A is my extreme ignorance because many of the questions that are asked would deserve a lecture. They're serious questions. And all I can do is 
throw a few ideas into the pool of your thinking. And of course, the work you do on them subsequently is far more important than anything I say. So their inadequacy is perhaps a good thing. So I'm not pretending to give you full answers. All I do is initially react with suggestions and you can follow those up. Well, my first point would be that when we read descriptions of what it means to be without God, again, I found C.S. Lewis very helpful. And it goes back to what I was saying earlier. God has given us a freedom to say yes and no to one another. He's also given us the freedom to say yes and no to him. Because you can only have a relationship with God if there's freedom in it. You cannot force people by violence or anything else to love you. It just cannot be done. You cannot force truth on people. So God appears in our world, and uh, there are various incidents in the New Testament where Jesus came, he healed people. He gave them back their sanity. He gave them back their public moral integrity, and so on. And other people watched and say, no thanks, go, and he went. Now that's a very serious thing. You see, it's not so much that God sends people to hell. That conjures up all kinds of ideas. It's much more this, that if you say no to God, God loves you so much he'll honor your choice, even though it hurts him. You see, God has done on his side everything to demonstrate his love for us. But love can't be forced. It has to be reciprocated. And as Lewis points out in one of his books, if you say no, what's God to do? He's demonstrated his love to the maximum. And if you say, no, I don't want you, God, God said, well, I'm sorry. Yes, well, you won't have me then. And what that means to be removed from God, just think of it. Today you got up, you had breakfast. Where did that come from? Oh, well, I paid for it with some money I earned uh, doing waiting last week. Where did you get the ability to do that? Ultimately, it comes from God. He's been very good to all of us, hasn't he? And some of us never say thank you to him, but that's another story. If all that were removed, and we say, God, I don't want you at any level at all, go! And God goes. That will be hell, ladies and gentlemen. And we will have chosen it. Hmm. And in the very nature of the universe, I'm afraid, there's no alternative. What do you want God to do? It's a very serious matter. If we are beings built to last for eternity, then this life is only a very short thing. And that's why these big ideas, it's important to think about them, particularly in universities. That's what universities are for, to present you with big ideas. And I hope you look at the big ideas from other worldviews. Mm -hmm. But these are huge concepts. So that's how I would initially respond to that. Yeah, good. Uh, okay, so you talked about evil being the result of the choices, of free choices of people, and people choose choose to go to hell. Um, this, well, this they choose to say no to God. Choose to say no to God, I sure. don't think people choose to go to hell. Sure. That's, that, that's an emotive way of putting it. Yeah. That, that puts you, people off, and I understand why it puts people off. But okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, so, so this person wants to know, it's a very personal question, if, if evil is caused by our choices, our sinful choices, how do we stop sinning? And is it possible to make only good choices if I, uh, from the perspective of this person, become a Christian? Oh, I sympathize with that question. <laughs> it reminds me of uh, Socrates, uh, and he's one of my intellectual heroes, you know. I like old Socrates, who went around asking questions, but he had some very silly views. And one of them was <laughs> that all you need is education, and you'll cure people of any problem. And Aristotle said, no, 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 I know what's good, but I find I can't do it. And that's a, a universal human problem. My answer to you is this. Christ made certain claims. And by the way, I, I speak just for a moment as a scientist. Many people say to me, you know, Christianity is not testable. That's nonsense. Of course it's testable. And let me illustrate that within this context. If Christianity weren't testable, I wouldn't be a Christian for a millisecond. Christ claims that if we trust him, 
and we trust that he died for our sin, whatever that means. It's a deep mystery, but then so is electricity. Nobody understands it completely. <laughs> and I mean that seriously. You know, very often people ask me, well, explain how the cross works. And I say, well, let me ask you a simple question first. What is energy? Oh, well, we can measure it. I said, I don't, what is it? Nobody knows. Not even Richard Feynman, who was one of your most brilliant Nobel Prize winning physicists. There are lots of things we don't know. But even if you don't know what electricity actually is, you can use it, can't you? And what Christ says, that if we trust him, he'll take the debt of our sin and give us real forgiveness. You can test that. As I go around the world, one of the big topics that's growing even more on university campuses is what is the good life? How can I flourish as a human being? How can I find meaning and value? And when you talk to people, one of the biggest problems is the burden of guilt. Whether or not they believe in God, that those, the mess up that we've all made of life that's coming up from the past and, and swallowing us, how do you get rid of that? Is there any way of getting rid of that? The Christian claim is there is. And the way the question was put, how can you stop sinning? You can't, but you can invoke God's help. And he will come in and give you a new power. Because here's the next Christian claim. That if a person trusts Christ, repents and trusts Christ, they receive not only forgiveness, but a new life with new powers. I've seen that happen thousands of times. Otherwise, it wouldn't be here. See somebody who's deeply dependent, say, on drugs or alcohol. And it's cleared up and they're living a life of peace and happiness and so on. And their children have got clothes to wear instead of... Uh, running around in rags because dad has drunk all the, the family savings. I mean, those are extreme examples, but when you see them again and again and again and again, you begin to say, aha, it's connected with Christ. And many atheists have begun to see that, but that's another story. <laughs> this is another personal question, very much related to the last one. What is your suggestion if I want to explore Christianity but I don't know where to start, for one. And for two, I don't really like Christians. <laughs> <laughs> well, start by cooking a Christian. I think I understand that. Do you know in North America, a friend of mine has done a survey of leaders of atheist and secular groups. And in every single case that he has examined, they all became atheists because of a negative experience of religion. That is an utter tragedy, ladies and gentlemen. Now, what do I say to you about that? Well, first of all, the existence of counterfeit money doesn't prove that the real stuff doesn't exist but it can make it hard to find. So what I suggest to you is you start to push back on some of your friends who claim to be Christian and talk to them and sit and listen to them. And I'm sure there are some in this room, at least, who subscribe to the Christian faith. But secondly, I'm not a Christian in that sense because of positive or negative experience of Christianity, but I happened to grow up in a home where my childhood experience was brilliantly positive. Christianity for me was open-ended, it was questioning. It never occurred to me that there were Christians who were intellectually closed down and all the rest of it. That was an amazing discovery later. So I was very fortunate. Christianity ran parallel to all my interests in the world and so on. But if you're really seeking Christ made a promise that if you seek, you'll find. So what I suggest you do, you're intelligent, you can read. I presume <laughs> that they take people into this university who can read. Um, start reading and asking your questions of uh, a piece of the New Testament, say the Gospel of John, the fourth Gospel. And ask your questions. And just be <coughs> open-minded and say, God, if there is a God, show yourself to me and ask others questions. 
Nobody's going to force you into it. This is the wonderful thing about it. You can actually interrogate it. And if you're not sure, then start interrogating some of your other friends from different traditions and see what makes them tick so that you can compare and make a reasoned decision. It can take some time, but friends can help. And I'm sure there are those that are willing to help. And there are campus organizations here who you'll find often are very different from the stereotype of the closed-minded Christian. Hmm. Um, I, I actually have a question for you. No, have you now? I yes. do, yeah. Yes, uh, I didn't get to ask I Vanessa feared them. you might. Mm. <laughs> uh, so, so I want to ask you personally, Dr. Uh, Lennox, um, has there been a time in your life where you doubted God's goodness or even where you doubted God's existence? Um, so how did, you, how did you process your doubts? And well, first um, of all, has there ever been a time? Of course, constantly. <laughs> And you say, really? Now, the problem lies in the word doubt. Often in a context like this, when we use the word doubt, we immediately think of the black hole feeling. Do you know that feeling where the whole world's collapsing in and everything's black and I'm sinking and there are no certainties? Mm. But the Latin word dubitare, from which we get doubt, simply means to be in two minds. And the reason I'm sitting here is that from the very word go as a child, I was taught to question my faith in God mm. and to subject it to critical analysis. And a turning point came in my first week at Cambridge. And I remember it so well because I was sitting at dinner and one of the students said to me rather too loudly from my liking because there's a big rugby crowd were sitting next to me, you know. <laughs> and he said, do you believe in God? And I thought, oh, but then he said, oh, sorry. He said, sorry, sorry, you're Irish. I should never have asked you that question. All you Irish believe in God and you fight about it. <laughs> well, of course, I'd heard that many times. But it was a turning point. I thought, right now, here I am sitting in Cambridge. I'm a Christian. My parents were. My grandparents were. Their parents were. So the answer is obvious. It's Irish genetics. That's it. How would you test this? Now, you see, growing up in Ireland, I'd met atheists, but when you scratched them, they were either Protestant atheists or Catholic atheists, so that wasn't <laughs> very much use. <laughs> I'm reminded of the late Christopher Hitchens saying, I'm really a Protestant atheist, he said. But anyway, um, but in Cambridge, there were some of the genuine sort, agnostics, all sorts. So I thought, right, how do I deal with this? So on that day, I deliberately befriended someone who did not share my worldview. I spent over 50 years doing it now. Opening my faith in God to its opposite. You don't know much about me, but that desire to be certain has driven me to extremes that you might be surprised. I learned German to speak it fluently which enabled me to go behind the Iron Curtain during the Cold War. You've probably never heard of it, you're so young. <laughs> Particularly to East Germany, where I could travel almost unobserved, to see what atheism did to a society. I'd been a Russian translator for many years, so when the wall fell, and I helped to knock it down, by the way, I started traveling to Russia as a guest of the Academy of Sciences, talking to people who'd been exposed to atheism in the core of their school system and their university system for 75 years. Why did I do that? Because what I discovered was this. The more vulnerable I made myself, the more I opened myself to questions, the more I discovered that Christianity had answers where atheism and other philosophies didn't. So my answer to your question is I spent my whole life doing that. <laughs> And of course big questions have come up. And of course I've sat with people who have wept their eyes out because their relatives have been wiped out in Auschwitz. And you feel that. You feel the weight of that. But life begins to teach you. And the more you expose yourself to the, the arguments of serious-minded other people, and I tell you I take atheist arguments very seriously. I don't want to be fooled, and I hope you don't want to either. So it's very important to think through your worldview and 
in my experience, however limited that may be, it gets established by being exposed to critical investigation, mm. which is what a university is about. Thank you. I have one final question, and then I'll uh, <coughs> allow you to I'll allow you to make some closing remarks. <laughs> I'll be watching the time, though. All right. Um, what would it take for you to um, change your mind about God? Whether whether you change uh, whether it's changing your mind about what God is like or his existence altogether? Well, what it would take is the following. Now let me give you a short list. First of all, you'd have to prove to me that atheism is a better explanation of the mathematical intelligibility of the universe than the idea of a rational, personal creator. And let me remind you, it was belief in a rational, personal creator that caused the rise of modern science with Galileo and Kepler and so on. Secondly, and related to that, you would have to prove to me that the explanation of the human mind in terms of bottom-up natural unguided processes was better than a top-down causation that relates it ultimately to an intelligence. Next, you'd have to show to me that Jesus Christ did not rise from the dead and that the many prophecies, the predictions that were made in the Old Testament, very specific ones concerning him, were simply a concatenation of coincidences. Next, you'd have to prove to me that my experience of God over the last 60 odd years has been an illusion in my family, in my with my children in my life. You'd have to demonstrate to me that the answers to prayer that I have experienced in my life were, were simply um, de deceptions. You'd have to prove to me that the many students and others uh, whose lives I've seen transformed by trusting in Christ were trusting in simply some airy-fairy mysticism. In other words, you'd have to do a very big job, but you're welcome to try. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> if, you, if you'd like, you can make a closing remark, but I take it that was it. Is that right? No, I am. Oh, well, you've <laughs> got more. Too. But it will be short. Um, no, it's, it's fine. We, we're all enjoying it. But, no, uh, no, 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 yeah. no, no, no. It's very late at my clock. <laughs> All I want to say is thank you very much, and I would like you to show your appreciation for the moderator tonight, first of all. <laughs> I don't think it's many doctoral students who could cope with it as magnificently as he has done, and I think <laughs> it's, it's lovely to see. Uh, I have appreciated it because I, I've immensely enjoyed it, and I've sensed your friendliness and your openness and so on. I've not much to say except that you've heard one side of the story from me tonight, and that's good. You'll have opportunity in this very famous university to hear other sides. The important thing is we get some opportunity within our university career to just step aside from the tyranny of the urgent, passing examinations and so on, to think of the bigger thing, and that is what is my worldview. Every one of us in this room has a worldview. By that I mean you've got answers, perhaps only half formed, to the big questions like the ones we've been asking tonight and saying something into that situation. One of the most satisfying things in life is to begin to build up answers to those questions because those will determine what your life means in terms of its flourishing. Let me put it this way. If you uh, were an automobile salesman, I believe you call them automobiles here. We call them cars. Um, <laughs> so do we, yeah. Oh, you do, yeah. very good. So you uh, sell me, let's imagine he's a car salesman and he sells me one of these four-wheel drive things, you know, rather large. And because he's interested in getting the next sale, he comes to visit me in my home. And as he comes up 
he, to his amazement, he sees this thing sitting in the middle of the lawn, surrounded by flower beds. And as he gets closer, he notices it's full of tomato plants. Tomatoes, you know. <laughs> and they're growing. And as he gets to the front door full of wonderment, I came out and I said, Oh, Keith, good to see you, man. This is a most marvelous bit of equipment you sold me. Do you know, I've won the tomato show for two years in a row as a result of this, because what I discovered in the front of this thing, there was a thing called AC. And if you put it on exactly the right point, you got huge tomatoes. What do you think he'd say before he rang a psychiatrist? <laughs> he'd say, but that's not what it's for. <coughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, you study at this university. Some of you may do material science or chemistry, or physics, and you're studying what things are made of. The ancient Greeks asked those questions. But they also moved on to ask the question, what are things made for? And I'm going to leave you with the, the biggest question of all. What were you made for? Thank you very much. <laughs>